Falcon 3.0, it's not a game about flying jets. It's a game about intelligent application of real world tactics and skills in a harsh combat environment. It demands skill and discipline and a firm understanding of some combat axioms that have been learned the hard way over a lot of years. In the next hour, you'll be taking part in Fighter Air Combat Trainer, a series of lesson plans taught by a pro. They're designed to teach you how to maneuver your jet in a visual environment. So grab your manual and your joystick and pay attention to this guy. He knows what he's talking about. Okay, we've got a pair we're engaging on the nose. Nothing good will happen to you without detecting the bandit. Okay, there's one to my right, one to my left. Four no tally. I'm taking the guy on the left. Tally. Bandit turns. We got to solve our problem. Okay, looks like he's going to turn on us too, too. I got him off the left wing at one six thousand. He's about six miles now. Second left. When you're maneuvering on a guy, you want to push him away. Okay, heads up, heads up, uh, two hundred. You got one coming. Yep, taking him from the bottom. Two ones, no joy. There is no set situation that always is the same. Box two kill on the, F, the high F-15 passing through west. Left hand turn. Two three, you got an F-15 on your tail. You're in a bad spot if you're not shooting somebody. Box two on the F-15 and a right hand turn, 15 pounds. Going for gun. Start thinking weapon. Start thinking shooting them and killing them. Two one, you cleared in. I just killed that guy. OK, I got both of eagles above each other. I'm on the high one. Visual the F-16. Crack it, crack it, kill F-15, right turn. Bad. Spitfire, Sabre, Thud, Eagle, some of the greatest fighters of all time. They're all here under one roof at the United States Air Force Museum just outside Dayton, Ohio. Hi, I'm Colonel Phil Hanley, United States Air Force retired. It was my privilege to fly a few of these planes. Just what is it about these great fighters that makes them seem bigger than life? Is it their performance? The fact that they're powerful and maneuverable means they can put on a great air show, but so can a Pitts S-1. The difference is that the pits was built for that purpose. Fighters weren't. What fighters do in air shows are nothing more than byproducts of their mission. These are instruments of war built for the single purpose of destroying enemies and their equipment. A risky business, and therein lies their mystique. Today, Pete Bonani, who's a current F-16 IP and weapons officer, is going to talk about a family of maneuvers for 1v1 aerial combat. In today's lexicon, they're called Basic Fighter Maneuvers, or BFM. In the past, they're known as dog fighting techniques. But regardless what you call them, they're as applicable to the old Sopwith Camel that sits in that building as they are this F-16 that Pete flies for the Virginia Air Guard. They're the blocking and tackling of aerial combat. And in the fighter game, if you can't fly good BFM, you'll never amount to a hill of beans. Hi, I'm Pete Bonani, and I'm here to talk to you today about air combat. Air combat, as you know, is a broad subject encompassing one versus one maneuvering to two versus many maneuvering to four versus many to all the air-to-ground subjects like Maverick employment, LGB employment, etc. What we're here today, though, to do is to talk about one versus one maneuvering. We're going to start with that building block and focus on one versus one maneuvering. Before we start, into our subject matter, we'd like to talk about the objective of this whole academic presentation. And those objectives are contained in what we call DLOs, or desired learning objectives. Okay, the desired learning objectives for this presentation are one, to be familiar with or get familiar with the terms, okay, terms and definitions of, of one versus one air combat. The second desired learning objective is be able to kill and survive in a one versus one scenario. Fighter pilot has one objective out there. That is to kill the enemy, destroy the enemy, and survive. So that's the second desired learning objective. Okay, to get to the first learning objective, we have a lot of terms and definitions that, that, it, that are, you need to understand in order to uh, cover one versus one maneuvering. And most of them have to do with geometry or angular relationships between aircraft. There's basically three different types of geometry. There's positional geometry, attack geometry, and the weapons envelope. Okay, so we're going to talk about all three of these. The first is positional geometry, which very specifically is the angular relationship between two aircraft out there uh, in the environment. In positional geometry, you have three... Heading crossing angle, or angle off, range, and aspect angle. Okay, the first of these is angle off which we also use the term heading crossing angle to describe. 
As you see from this picture, we've got two jets with velocity vectors in space. The F-16's heading in this way, and we've got the fulcrum going this way. The difference, the angular difference between their headings, measured in degrees, is what we call angle off. Okay, the second term is range. It's fairly simple also. It's just the distance between two targets. Normally, fighter pilots talk in range in terms of nautical miles, okay, which is 6,000 feet. So it's outside of 6,000 feet, you talk nautical miles and tenths. Inside 6,000 feet, you talk in terms of feet. So for range, it's just, again, a, a straight line measurement distance between two aircraft here. The next term for positional geometry is aspect angle. To define it simply, aspect angle is a measure from the target's tail to your aircraft. So in this particular picture, the first scene, okay, from the target's tail to your jet, that's zero aspect. If you're out in front on the nose of the bandit, that would be 180 degrees of aspect. Out here, this is 45 degrees right aspect. Aspect is independent of heading, and that's what gets confusing to guys. It has nothing to do with aircraft heading. So this he guy could be heading in any direction. At that particular instant in time, he would be at 45 degrees right aspect. The reason aspect is useful, because if you know range and you know aspect, then you also know your displacement from the target, okay? which is going to be important, as we're going to talk about soon. The next type of geometry we're going to talk about is the attack geometry. Attack geometry is a pursuit course that you take when you start behind the bandit and start an attack. Okay, you have three different options you can take as you attack a target. You can go lag pursuit or put your nose behind the bandit. You can go pure pursuit, put your nose on the bandit. Or you can go lead pursuit, put your nose out in front of the bandit. Here's a falcon scene of a lag pursuit course. As you can see, the flight path marker or the velocity vector of the aircraft through the sky is behind this turning bandit. So this is a lag pursuit course. The next pursuit option is pure pursuit. And that's when you point directly at the target. Okay, if you put your uh, flight path marker on the target or near him, okay, that's pure pursuit. And here's a Falcon scene of pure pursuit. You have the target, okay, you have your flight path marker, and they're kind of co-located right there together. So here the fighter is flying a pure pursuit course. Now, if you took that same flight path marker and drug it out in front of the target, okay, that would be lead pursuit, okay, a lead pursuit course. So what are your attack pursuit options? We started out behind the bandit, okay, and our pursuit options were nose behind, lag, okay, nose on pure, nose out in front lead. And you can see what that does in terms of your heading crossing angle. If you hold, maintain a lag pursuit course, right, you're going to maintain more or less a, he a constant heading crossing angle. If you point them all the way in, what's going to happen? You're going to end up with increasing heading crossing angle. Lead pursuit course will tend to solve your heading crossing angle problems given the fact you can maintain your nose and lead. Okay, so th those are the three attack options. Okay, the next geometry uh, subject we're going to talk about is weapons. There's basically three types of weapons okay, that are carried by a modern fighter. Radar missiles, heat missiles, category of missiles, and we'll look at the weapons envelope. The weapons envelope is just this area around the tools and the gun. Okay? Radar missiles and heat missiles will just put in one target where we can enter and be in parameters to shoot a missile, okay? That's this area here. The minimum range, if you're inside here now, you can't shoot, is called R-min. The outside range is called R-max, and the area in between is normally dictated by the type of missile you have and by what the target's doing. Okay, if you have a, a, a like an AMRAM or a long-range missile that grows, and if you have a heat missile, then it would be smaller. Also, if the target's going faster, Okay, that would make this, this particular area out front grow. It would also make this area shrink if you were behind because now the, the, if you were shooting somewhere in the front, the missile could get there easily because the, the envelope would grow in the front because of his speed. But if you were trying to shoot him from behind, if he was going faster, okay, that would, that would shrink our max in the rear because now the missile has to go faster to catch him. The gun is the next weapon, and the gun is different from missiles in that obviously they don't guide. They're unguided projectiles. You fire the gun, it goes out there, hits the target, or it doesn't, okay? So the gun envelope 
isn't a donut, it's just an area around the target. You have the, the maximum range out here, okay, in the front for most gunshots in an F-16, it's probably somewhere around 4,500 feet, and in the rear it's probably somewhere around 2,500 feet. But again, there's no min range because it's just a bullet. Anywhere in there you could shoot the gun and hit him. Now you got to realize if you're taking a shot really in close, you can end up wearing part of his aircraft you know, if, if uh, you hit him, you know, and, and I've seen that on the dart, you know, guys hit the dart inside a thousand feet and pieces of the dart, you know, rain all around their aircraft. So you got to be careful, but there's no arm in in that the bullet will still kill them. Might kill you too, but the bullet will still kill them. We have just covered terms and definitions used to define the geometry of air combat. We have discussed three basic types of geometry, positional geometry, attack geometry, and the weapons envelope. Positional geometry is the angular relationship between two aircraft and consists of angle off, range, and aspect angle. Attack geometry consists of the pursuit options that can be taken by the offensive fighter. These pursuit courses are lag pursuit, pure pursuit, and lead pursuit. Even 75 years since the conclusion of World War I, names such as Newport, and Spad, and Folker, and Von Richthofen bring back vivid images. It was the birth of fighter aviation. As the war began, the aircraft was used only as a scout. Opposing pilots actually waved as they passed. At this courtesy ended the day one of the pilots pulled out a pistol and fired at the other airplane. This, of course, led to handheld rifles, then flex-mounted guns, and ultimately to the fixed forward-firing machine gun. Once the gun position became fixed, the aircraft became the aiming device, and through necessity, basic fighter maneuvers were born. So when Pete talks about Luffberries and Emmelmans, those aren't just arbitrary titles. They're the names of the men that invented the maneuvers. Finally, lest you think these crates were simple to fly, consider this aircraft, the Sopwith F-1 Camel. It's a matter of record that it shot down more enemy planes than any aircraft in the war. However, it's also a matter of record that more pilots were killed learning to fly it than died at the hands of the enemy. We just talked about basic terms and definitions. Now let's talk about offensive BFM. Here are the offensive BFM DLOs. Given an initial position of advantage, okay, given you start behind the guy in an offensive position, the first objective is to maintain 3-9 line. You know, that, that's pretty, pretty intuitive. Okay, We start behind him, let's stay behind him. Well, what is 3-9 line? And we should define some terms. As you guys know fighter pilots talk in clock positions. Yeah, got 12, we got 6, you know, check 6, those kind of terms. We also got 3 and 9. If you draw a line between the 3-9 line, we talk in terms of 3-9 line all the time. Is the guy in front of your 3-9 line? Is the guy behind your 3-9 line? Okay, so the DLO here is given that you start behind him, stay behind him. You know, it's a reasonable objective, you know. Okay, now once you stay behind him, shoot him. You know, you don't have to fly an air show back behind at 6 o'clock. The guy looks back, yeah, that's some good flying you're doing back there. You know, you, we want to make a shot. You want to get into a position and shoot a weapon. So that's the next deal, though. Give it, maintain 3-9 line, then shoot. The last one is if you can't do one or two, then, then get out of there. You know, leave, separate, because, you know, again, you know, you're in, a, you're in a bad spot if you're not shooting somebody. A lot of discussions. I always like to start my offensive discussions by dispelling a couple myths. Everybody wants to think in terms of, okay, the bandit does a move, okay, and I need a, I need a move, okay, well, let me look through my cards, okay, the bandit does a, a right-hand turn, okay, 10 degrees nose low, then I do a rat's ass shimshe, okay, yeah, that, 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 that's the counter, you know, uh, but, but you really can't think in terms of a, you know, a chess kind of thing, you know, where a move, okay, then there's this perfect counter move that, it, this doesn't work that way, it's a, it's a fluid thing, where the bandit does something and now we got to always be maneuvering our nose, and, and you know, you know from out, from out there flying that that's just the way it works, there is no set situation that always is the same. The other thing we have to note is that, uh, you know, BFM costs energy. When you move your nose in a fighter, it costs you energy. The two are related. The object of BFM is exchanging energy, which is aircraft altitude and airspeed, okay? 
for nose position. That's what we're trying to do. We've got the jet flying along with a certain, uh, you know, mock on it, certain amount of knots, smash on the jet. We've got certain amount of altitude. Now we're going to exchange that. We're going to spend it to move the nose. Okay, it's going to cost you. Now, when you go straight, you can, you can, uh, you know, you can gain it back. But th there's a relationship between the two. The other thing you have to note about BFM is it's not flown in the present. BFM is flown in the future. You don't fly to where the aircraft is. You've got to fly to where he's going. And there's some steps to flying BFM in the future. Those steps are pretty much observe the bandit, see what he's doing, you know, yeah. Predict where he's going. Maneuver or fly the jet based on this prediction. And then when something changed, as, as it will, you know, react to that change. So those are the steps, you know. Observe, predict, maneuver, react. And they're subliminal. I mean, they're not on the surface. You don't write those on your lineup card go, okay, what's next, what's next, okay. <laughs> predict, you know. <laughs> you know, look down and, oh, shoot, I dropped my lineup card. Now I'm in big trouble. No, it, it, but, it, but it's good to note that, though, that it's flown in the future and you've got to go through these steps, okay. Let's talk about BFM problems. Why? Well, offensive BFM, you know, I'm, I'm, we're obviously going to talk about maneuvering the jet and those kind of things, but the reason we are is because, you know, if we had, just don't picture a fulcrum here, picture United Flight 232 to Denver, okay, and here we are out here in our F-16, and we look at him and we think, man, let me, let me, I'll take a shot at that guy, so we pull up behind him, you know, and if he doesn't see us or react, we have no need to do any BFM, right, we don't need to do anything, right, he's flying along, we just get behind him and shoot. The reason you need to do BFM is because if this is, instead this is not an airliner now, this is a fulcrum and he sees you and turns, he will create BFM problems. Instantly by me turning, you see heading crossing angle build, you see aspect changing, you see range changing. Those are the BFM problems that are created by a turn. Bandit turns, we got to solve our problem. The way we solve a problem is we turn. Bandit turns, we turn. Okay? Uh, how do you turn? There's two things. You, it's how you turn and when you turn the count, as, as you know from flying. You know, you can go, okay, Pete said to turn, you know, and, uh, and I've seen this, uh, I've seen this burning JP4, I've seen it in simulation, I've seen it everywhere. You know, a guy says, ready, ready, go, he turns, and if you don't turn at the right place, if you just say, okay, turn. <laughs> oh, man, that didn't quite work. Yeah. I, I, I knew I should have stayed awake past the just the turn part. So, so we're going to teach you, you know, kind of how, you know, not only, you know, how to turn, but when to turn. But first, let's talk about turns themselves, because turns are important. If you're not at corner airspeed, the turn dynamics are quite different. What corner airspeed is, is this airspeed in the jet where you can turn the quickest, tightest turn. Okay, in an F-16, that's about 440 knots, okay? Turns have two things associated with them. They have rate, that's how fast you move the nose. They have radius, or how tight the turn is. Those two things. I'm gonna, I thought it'd be interesting to take a look at Falcon to show you the effects of one aircraft pulling about six to seven Gs at 450 knots. That's right at corner, right? Okay, you started the turn right here. He ended it right there. And you could take a look at, at, again, his rate and radius as he makes the turn. The next guy I'll show up here turning, he's at 550 knots. He's 100 knots above corner. And you can take a look at where his, uh, his rate and radius is carrying him. Much farther out. Okay, he's all the way out here. And also you would note, if, if, we, if we took a look at this thing, this guy started here, got all the way around the corner to about here. In the same time, it took this guy starting in about the same place and getting to right about here. So 100 knots of airspeed difference makes a big difference in, ra in radius. It, but in just as important, it makes a big difference in rate also. You're just not moving the nose. I might also note that you know, these guys are both at the same G. So they're both suffering equally. Because G is, is, you know, you suffer under G. But one guy's not doing too much at all for, for the amount of suffering he's doing, you know. And the other guy is moving the airplane around. So it's very important to be at the right airspeed, you know, right at corner airspeed when you, when you do this. Okay. Those are turns looking from up from above. Now let's take a, uh, a look at a vertical turn. Vertical turns are different in many ways, primarily because we've got gravity. Okay, so what gravity tends to do is flatten out the turn on the back side, and up at the top side, you'll notice you can get a much tighter radius and a much better rate. And this is what fighter pilots call the energy egg. It looks like an egg. Okay, because you get a much better turn up, up here at the top, 
and you have a much worse turn here at the bottom. And that becomes important when we start to talk about head-on BFM and those kind of things. The nose-high fighter has a big advantage. Why? Because he's got Dodge G at the top. You know, he's got like the big hand pullish, pushing him down. Down at the bottom, you have the, you know, the negative effects of, of G at the bottom side. So you've got to play that, okay, when you're, when you're fighting BFM. The next concept with turns is turning room. You need room to turn. You can get it vertically or you can get it horizontally or horizontally displaced from the bandit. Either way, though, when, you, you, when, you, when you're maneuvering on a guy, you want to push him away to get some room away from him so you can turn. And when you make that turn, what? You want to be at the proper airspeed. How much turning room do you need? You need a diameter. You need a turn diameter. I mean, how much is a turn diameter for an aircraft at 450, you know, 450 knots? Well, it depends, because vertically up here, a turn diameter is probably, you know, a lot less because you have God's G. Down underneath, it's a lot more, and then horizontally, that's another number, too. But normally, uh, about six to 7,000 feet is what you need, displacement for about a 7G turn. A little less for up here, a little more for down here, but you need to get away from the bandit. You need to push him off so that you can take this rate radius now and fit it around to fly behind the bandit. Okay, let's take a look at two targets, an offensive BFM setup where the bandit starts out at two nautical miles or outside your turn circle. You're going to see the fulcrum go into a hard left-hand turn and essentially meet the F-16 in the front. There's really not much this guy can do. Even if he went straight, it wouldn't matter. This guy could pull around and meet him in the front quarter because why? This pass started at two nautical miles. Okay, this fulcrum was only pulling seven Gs but he can meet him in the front even at 7 Gs. Well, let's take a look at another Falcon view. Same, this is the exact same setup, but now you can see it from a, from a different view to help reinforce it. You jump this guy, you, start, you see this turn, you're watching him, watching him, watching him, and you start seeing the front part of his airplane. What happened? He started outside his turn circle, okay? And there you have a front quarter pass from this, okay? So it's important to ask yourself the question. When I start a fight, I kind of start jumping this guy, and, and I ask myself this question, self, am I inside or outside his turn circle? Is his present turn rate going to cause a front quarter pass? If his present turn rate is going to cause a front quarter pass, I'm outside his turn circle. So, so what should I do different if I start outside his turn circle? Don't go for turning room, OK? Don't go for turning room. Why? Because you're not, it's not going to work. It's just not going to work. If you go up, you might give him turning room. So if you, if you start seeing the front, start thinking weapons. Start thinking shooting them and killing them in the front with a weapon because there's nothing else you really can do. Now let's show a pass inside the turn circle, and you'll, got, you'll see from Falcon kind of how much different this one is. This is about a 7,000-foot setup. Again, fulcrum against F-16. Fulcrum's going to go into the same left-hand turn at the same G, and the Falcon's going to pretty much react to pretty much the same way he did before. However, the geometry is different from the start. Here's another view of the same thing, exact same turn, quite a bit different. You don't see that front part of the airplane in, during this turn. You just see the F-16 maintaining 3-9 line position, pulling, pulling, and then finally closing in for a gunshot or a missile shot or whatever, whatever he's in parameters to take there. Okay, it's important then to talk about how we turn. I like to use a, a, an anatomy uh, analogy. If you start at the, at the shoulder, the guy can turn and meet you in the front. Okay, he can turn and meet you in the front. You're too far out. You're outside his turn circle. If you start closer in, near the elbow, now you can maintain your position on him because you drive into this elbow position just like you saw in the telestrator and you can maintain your position. How do you get to that spot? That's the key of offensive BFM. Fulcrum's out there flying around. Okay, you're starting behind him. You start to see him turn. If he doesn't turn, no BFM problems. You just drive behind and kill him. Okay, but he starts to turn. He's giving you BFM problems. You've got to solve those problems with the turn. You ask yourself, self, am I inside or outside this guy's turn circle? If I'm outside, then I better start thinking weapons, 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 and then a head-on fight. If I don't see, start seeing the front of his airplane, then what do I got to start thinking? I got to drive to, I got to BFM. I got to do offensive BFM. I got to drive to where the fight started. Okay, drive to where the fight started. That's the first step. When he turns, say, okay, he started his turn right about there. I remember this discussion of getting to the elbow, so I'm going to fly to the elbow. I'm going to drive to where the fight started, 
and then I'm going to start my turn when I see the line of sight rate start to increase. Okay, the fulcrum's going to turn, turn, and at some point he's going to start to turn rapid. When that line of sight rate increases, that's when you want to start to turn. And I've sat there in the back seat of D model and B model F-16s and seen that place come and go, and we're still driving, you know, because the guy, it just takes time to figure, you know, we're driving along, and I there's a line of sight rate. Nobody's turning. Turn, 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 you know. Too late. We, we turn too late. So I've got a, so I've got a, a crutch at 30 degrees when, off the HUD. That's when you want to start your turn. And if you turn right there, you make your turn, you drive your flight path marker to a lag pursuit, two ship widths back, and you just hold that lag pursuit course, hold that lag pursuit course, hold that lag pursuit course until you get to 3,000 feet. Remember, BFM is an exchange of energy for position. So you're spending knots for nose position all the way around this corner. When you get to 3,000 feet now, the fulcrum's slower and you're slower, and now at 3,000 feet, that's the turn diameter. That's when you want to now pull the nose onto the target and take your gunshot. One note of caution as you pull your nose on them. When you get your fuselages aligned, what controls overtake when your fuselages are aligned? Your left hand, the throttle. Okay, out here, you can do it with nose position. You control your overtake with nose position. But when you get your fuselage aligned, the only thing that controls overtake is this left hand. When you start seeing low aspect, Low heading crossing angle, you got to use the throttle, you know, boards, whatever you need to control that. So now we're right in for a gunshot now on the guy. We were at 3,000 feet, we pulled our nose on him, and we'll just, we'll just show that here in Falcon. The guy has flown effective BFM. He got into 3,000 feet, his nose was in lag, as you saw, and now he's pulling his nose up to the target once he gets to 3,000 feet, taking the gunshot and, and getting the kill. Now, note, all gunshots have one thing that, 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 that characterizes them, and that is the gun cross must be put right off the nose of the aircraft. If that aircraft jinx, then take the gun cross and move it to the new position. Okay, aircraft makes a move, take that gun cross and always keep it, just project a long pitot boom off the target and put that gun cross right on that pitot boom. If he jinx, put the gun cross up there and then let the funnel catch up. First move the gun cross because that's the true departure line of the bullets. Next, play the funnel to make the, to make the shot. Offensive BFM is the series of aircraft maneuvers we use to stay behind an opponent and ultimately fire missiles or the gun. In our discussion of offensive BFM, we talked about the need for being inside the bandit's turn circle before maneuvering for turning them. We also discussed the steps for driving your jet into gun parameters. Remember, offensive BFM is not a set piece move counter move event, but rather a series of fluid maneuvers flown in the future, not to where the bandit is, but to where he will be. Over half a century ago, Winston Churchill told an anxious nation that they would fight the Germans on the beaches, the landing grounds, the fields, and the streets. But in the dark summer of 1940, the Brits didn't fight them in any of those places. They fought them in the skies, and in doing so, created perhaps the greatest fighter matchup of all time. The Mark V Spitfire and this aircraft, the legendary ME-109. The Spit was a little faster, but the 109 could outclimb it and had a higher ceiling. Luftwaffe pilots tended to think the Spit could outturn them, but RAF pilots who flew a captured 109 disagreed. One clear advantage of the 109 was its fuel-injected engine that allowed it to maneuver under negative G. The Rolls-Royce in the Spit was carbureted. Which was the better plane? You can make credible arguments either way. But the bottom line is that a handful of British fighter pilots stood off the Luftwaffe long enough that Hitler lost interest in the cross-channel invasion and attempted instead to go to Moscow in the winter. A fateful mistake. Okay, next up is defensive BFM. You know, we talked about offense where we started with initial position of advantage. Now we're going to talk about defense. Okay, in defense, the bandit has an initial position of advantage on you. And of course, we've got some desired learning objectives for defensive BFM. The desired learning objectives are given an initial position of advantage by the bandit. The first objective is to defeat all missile and gun attacks. If there's a missile in the air, then we quit fighting the bandit. We start fighting the missile or the gun, okay? Because there's no need to worry about the bandit if you're, you know, 
cockpit fills with hair, teeth, and eyeballs, you know, and they're not in the proper lineup, you know. So, uh, so we've got to fight anything in the air first, okay? Next, we've got to create BFM problems for the bandit. You know, he just did some turns and created some BFM problems for us, so now we're going to try to create some BFM problems for him. Okay, then when the bandit BFMs, we're going to take away his turning room, if we can, or, you know, kill him. Or if we can't do that, we're going to try to get out of the fight, separate, okay, extend, get energy, or, if we, or, if we, or get all the, out of, all the way out of the fight and, and separate. Okay, so those are the DLOs for, for defensive BFM. Nothing good will happen to you without detecting the bandit. There's three ways to detect bandits, basically. You can do it on radar, which we're not going to talk about in this particular uh, block of instruction. You can do it with threat warning system, and the other way is visually. First, uh, the way we're going to talk about is threat warning system. You see Falcon here, a Falcon cockpit shot. It looks similar to a, the A model or a C model F-16. You've got now a bandit at 6 o'clock showing up on the threat warning system. So that's, that's one of the ways. You, you get him on, on threat warning. And you might say, well, that's not a great way, but it's better than, you know, better than not detecting him at all and end up getting ambushed, okay? So that you need, to, you need him to detect him. The other way to do it is visually. Here we have a guy driving along, and we've got a bandit uh, at deep 6 o'clock. So visually is the other way. Now, could you see this guy if he didn't have his radar on looking from that shot? Probably not, but, you, you know, your wingman, that's why you have wingman, because, you know, he can see more plan form. You know, a, a needle-nose target is a tough target to pick up at your 6 o'clock because it's, there's just not much to see. But a wingman looking back uh, will be able to, you know, see that vertical stabilizer and see some plan form. So uh, the wingman might be calling you to turn, okay? So visual is the other way. Okay, we talked about a bandit, right, that started two miles out in front of you, you know, and he made, made this defensive turn, you know. We can do the same thing to him. We detect a guy farther enough back, we need to turn hard to meet him in the front. How do you do a defensive turn? When you detect somebody's behind you, you just take your lift vector, okay, roll the jet, put your lift vector right on the target, okay, the lift vector comes straight out the top of the airplane, okay, and you take that lift vector, you put it right on the target, and you pull. Hopefully, you will get a front quarter pass out of it if the fight started with a bandit outside your turn circle. Let's take a look at that in Falcon. Here's the F-16, 01 out front, fulcrum behind. Okay, and again, you've got this long-range setup, this two-mile setup, and you can see the effect of the turn. Just a good, hard F-16 turn at corner velocity, bang, a head-on BFM pass rather than a guy staying behind you, okay? Let's take a different view of that same maneuver. You're driving around, see the bandit behind you, put your lift vector right on him. Here's about a good 7G lift vector on pull. You notice his lift vector's right on him the whole time, and then you get a high, you know, high line of sight rate pass, a high angle pass at end game. Okay. What happens when the bandit doesn't start at two miles? And we started with the easy one. Guys at two miles, you pull, bang. And I know, I know what you're thinking, because I, I look out there, when I've taught this course for lots of years, and I look out at the guys, and, and I know they're waiting for me to tell them the maneuver. They're thinking, there's a maneuver. <laughs> and, if, and if I learn it, then I'll know what to do, because I've seen, I've seen the movie. I mean, there's a movie out, right? <laughs> and uh, there's a guy playing it. It doesn't mind, you know, getting makeup and having his eyebrows plucked and stuff. And that guy, you know, uh, he, he did this maneuver, and, and guess what? Guy flew out in front of him. There ain't no such maneuver. Okay, I'm just here to tell you there ain't no such maneuver. If a guy starts, a good guy, uh, let me tell you how good, you against your clone. I always like to talk in terms of you against your clone. Your clone starts back behind you at 6,000 feet. You do the perfect move, right? You already learned that. Lift vector on, corner velocity, pull. Your clone does everything right. What's going to happen? Your clone's going to be in your chili in no time, right? If he makes no mistakes, he's in your, there is no move. You know, you can't, you, there, I, I wish I could tell you that there was some move you could do there isn't. So all you can do is put your lift vector on the guy when he starts inside the turn circle. The sooner you start this turn, right, the better. Because you'll get more BFM problems for him if you get it going soon. So don't delay doing, you know, something creative. Because usually getting creative doesn't help you. You just look back and go, oh, there's a guy behind me. Pull, 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 right at corner, right at corner. Check your airspeed. I'm at corner. Keep pulling, keep pulling. And then you wait for him to do something wrong. Okay, if he turns too late, he could get stuck in deep lag, right? You can just keep this turn coming and keep his nose stuck to lag. If he turns too early, not, he doesn't drive to the elbow, right? He starts to go to lead pursuit out at 5,000 feet. When a guy does that to me, I go, great. All I got to do now is do what? Defend against the gunshot. Okay? All I got to do is defend against the gunshot. But if he does the perfect move, all you're going to buy is time. 
Now, you may say that, no, oh, that's, that's not worth a shit, you know, I'm buying time. I mean, but that's what you want to do because even if it's real and a guy's back behind you, you do want to buy time because things can go wrong, right? A rattlesnake could, you know, jump up and, you know, bite him in the throat or something from his cockpit. No, but a lot of things can go wrong is what I'm saying. So you just got to buy yourself time and, and live as long as you can because maybe somebody will come in and help you or something. Okay, here's a defensive turn at one mile, and we're going to see the effect of a you against your clone fight. You know, I mean, this won't be, uh, this won't have a surprising conclusion. Your clone comes in in a fulcrum. You're in an F-16. You're doing everything right. You're pulling your lift vector right on him, and you know, it doesn't have a real happy ending, as you can see there. You know, missile defense. Okay, anytime you see a missile in the air, that was our first DLO, right? If a missile was in the air. We're going to defend against it. Okay, we got to do that. You fight missiles with aspect. That's how you fight a missile with aspect. And what I mean by fight missiles with aspect is you put them on the beam. Okay, you put them at nine o'clock. You put them at three o'clock. That's how you fight a missile. We have a telestrator shot of a missile attack and a correct response of a guy taking the missile and putting it on the beam. Missiles in flight. Falcons in a right uh, right hand turn. Falcon turns, puts the missile on the beam, and he gets lucky. Okay, the missile doesn't, doesn't hit him. Why do you put missiles on the beam? Okay. You put missiles on the beam because it makes them pull the maximum amount of lead. Okay, what missiles do is they come off the rail and they zero out their line of sight rate. They, they, they pull lead pursuit so that they can get to you faster. Why do they want to get to you faster? Well, it isn't meanness, you know, because they feel they'll kill you no matter what. They want to get to you faster because then they can get there with the rocket motor burning. So when you maneuver, they've got energy, right? All maneuvering in the air costs energy. You spend energy. Missiles spend energy, too. If you can get that rocket motor to burn out and you make a move, the missile is not going to be able to maneuver very well. I mean, one turn, and, you know, and it'll run out of steam. So, it's, so that's why you want to do that. Fight missiles with aspect. Put them on the beam. Okay, gunshots. Uh, for a guy to kill you with a gun, he needs to solve three problems. Or for you to kill somebody with a gun. You need to be in range. You need to have your nose in lead pursuit. Why? Because it's just like Kentucky windage on a, you know, shooting a duck. You know, you gotta shoot out in front because you've got a projectile with a fine, you know, a time, time of flight, essentially. It takes time to get there. And you need to be in plane. Those are the three things you need. Those are the three things he, he needs when he starts to close to you for a gunshot. Which one of those do you think you can deny him? Could you deny him range? No, because, you know, we just tried, we just did our best turn, right? And he came right into, he got right in on us. Can you deny him lead? That's what we're trying to do. We're pulling as hard as we can, trying to get his nose in lag. But if he drives to the elbow, right, and at about 3,000 feet pulls his nose to lead, you can't stop him from getting lead pursued. If you could, you, you're doing the best you can pulling, right? No, you can't deny him that one either. So the only one you can deny him, usually effectively, is plane of motion. Okay, how do you deny him plane? Deny him plane with a violent maneuver where you just roll the airplane at least 70 or 80 degrees and then pull out of the plane you were in. You've got to do it at the right time. Okay, you've got to do it at the right time. If you do it too early, the guy can just reposition. You know, the fulcrum guy sees you out there, he's coming in for the gunshot, he goes to lead, you go jink. You jink too soon, he makes a correction. Okay, that, that doing it too soon is is bad but doing it too late is worse so you know as you start to see him come in and go ready ready you know then your left arm sawed off by the gun oh no now i can't adjust the throttle oh shoot you know so anyhow let's take a look at a good effective roll out of plane okay you got a, a, a bandit coming in on an f-16 and you see the guy jinking here rolling out of plane okay and getting out of the funnel is really what you want to do because the funnel shows the bullet dispersion of the gun so you want to make a violent enough move to maneuver completely out of plane here you see you know the guy out of plane with funnel defensive bfm is easy to understand put your lift vector on the bandit and pull the bandit is outside your turn circle at two nautical miles. You can force him in front of your 3-9 line with a 7G pull. The bandit starts near your turn circle and drives to lag. You're in big trouble. There's no magic moves to spit him out. All you can do is hope for a mistake and take advantage of any bandit blunders. If no mistakes are made, get ready for a guns jink. Remember, it is better to jink too early rather than too late. Here they are side by side, the air combatants of the Korean War. 
This is the F-86A Sabre, to this day one of the most beautiful jet fighters ever built. Big bubble canopy so you could see, low wing loaded so you could turn, good speed, good stable gun platform. Posing the Sabre was this airplane, the MiG-15, an aircraft that set the mold for many a Russian design that would follow. It had a big engine, high left wing, and three very large cannons. Now for MiG Alley. The end result was that this relatively unsophisticated fighter could outturn, outclimb, and outaccelerate the Sabre. The matchup was a blowout, over 10 to 1 for the 86, mostly because of the skills of the Sabre pilots. Missiles weren't around then, so there were no BVR engagements. The men who flew F-86s found these MiGs with their Mark I model eyeballs, used mutual support, discipline, and great BFM to get to their 6 o'clock, and simply blew them away the old-fashioned way, the 650 caliber machine gun. We just talked about defensive BFM. Now let's talk about head-on BFM. Here are the head-on BFM DLOs. Given a, a head-on pass, okay, given a head-on position on the bandit, first thing is to kill the bandit, okay? Employ weapons if you can. Next is to BFM and gain 3-9 line position on the bandit. Okay, that's the next thing we'd like to do. Given we can't kill him at the pass or whatever, do some BFM and gain 3-9 line. The next thing, or the last thing, the last DLO is, if you can't do those two, leave. Okay, and you notice that's a recurring theme, you know. If you can't really do the objectives, okay. We start talking about head-on BFM. We talked earlier about how we exchanged P sub S energy, energy for position. Here's, some, here's my knots, I want position. Well, here's the thing you're going to have to ask yourself. When you pass a guy like this, it's going to, it took a lot of BFM when you started behind him. And it took a lot of energy to kill him. Well, you can imagine now when you start like this how much time and energy it's going to take. Okay, this is a 1v1 BFM discussion. So we're not talking about time. Time is tactics. You can think of time as tactics. We're not going to talk about tactics. We're just going to talk about now, okay, we're committed to fight, so we're going to fight. But I, I will throw out, though, when you pass a guy head on, you've got to think very seriously that do I really want to fight this guy or not? because it's going to take a lot of time to kill him. Now, you may not have a choice, right? You may be defending something or someone, in which case now the tactical choice is made. You've got to turn and fight. You've got an AWACS back there. So there, there may be a tactical reason, you know, why you have to turn and fight. But you really got to ask yourself, it's going to take a lot of energy to do this, okay? A fighter pilot, when he gets in a fight, has got to think in terms of his escape window. And I'll just bring this out briefly now. An escape window, I always think in terms of an escape window my safe path out of the fight. If, if I jump a guy and I'm two miles back and he doesn't see me, I have a huge escape window. At any time I can take my jet, fly through that window and get out of this fight, okay? The window's huge when you, when you end up in a fight. You know, I, I, I like to draw a window just to show you the effects. If you start behind a bandit that doesn't see you, that window's huge, okay? If you start head on on a bandit, okay? That escape window's still big. We can fly our jet, whoosh, right out that window and get away, okay? Once you start this turning fight, once you start this groveling, okay, once the spaghetti starts to spread all over the place, all over the sky, that window closes down, and it closes down rapidly because as you expend energy, the window closes. As you turn, every 90 degrees you turn, your situation awareness goes down of what's going on around you. Okay, if you're fighting this one guy and you're in this food fight with him going round and around, you don't, have, you don't know what's going on around you. You're just fighting this one guy. As your situation goes down, as your energy goes down, your escape window closes down. Your chance to get out of the fight, you lose that chance to get out of the fight. Okay, so now we've got several choices when we go out and pass this guy and we're committed to fight. Let's talk about some terms and definitions here of a head-on pass. Here we're going to show a one-circle fight, because you always hear in head-on, one-circle, two-circle, those kind of things. Here we have a one-circle fight, because what happens is both targets turn, and their circle is on the same side. You had a fulcrum turning right, an F-16's turning left. This is what we call a one-circle fight, because the radiuses are on the same side. Okay, that's a one-circle fight. Okay. If there's a one-circle fight, then there's got to be a, you know, a two-circle fight, of course. And, and what happens there is both, 
both guys turn into each other. They both make like, on a left-to-left -left pass, they both turn left. And you can see that here on the Telestrator also. Fulcrum versus Falcon. You're going to pass head-on again, and both guys will turn, looks like, left. What happens here is you've got two circles, okay? That's a two-circle fight. Let's talk about why you'd want to do one or the other. You'll notice in the one-circle fight, when this guy turned this way, it ended up being a much tighter, you know, you had one guy turning like that and the other guy, you know, turning the same way. You end up with this range being a lot tighter. In a two-circle fight, as they come together, this range that you come head-to-head -head is a lot greater, okay? So what tactical implication does that have? Well, if you're fighting, let's say you ran out of missiles and you're fighting a guy that still has missiles, heat missiles. You probably want to try to fight a one-circle fight against that guy. You probably want to jam. You probably want to get inside our men, right, and stay there. Boy, don't want to get outside our men on this guy, because I ain't got a missile. All I got is a gun. There's no arm in for a gun. I want to get inside his arm in for his missile and stay there. The same thing will happen to an airplane that doesn't have a head-on, you know, shooting capability. Like if you fight a, uh, you know, a MiG-17, MiG-19 guy can't shoot you in the face, he's probably going to want to take you one circle. He's going to want to take you one circle because he can jam your missile. Okay, two-circle fight, just realize you're fighting a fulcrum and the fight goes two-circle, what's going to happen here? You're both going to have a shot opportunity here, so you've got to be careful. You've got to be careful in here. He can shoot you also. So a two-circle fight basically gives you more room away from the guy. The other option we have is to go, we can go flat, one circle, two circle. We can go vertical, right? We can go into the vertical. Normally, a vertical move in an F-16 is never done at the initial pass. It's usually done after we turn one way or the other. And most fights, most all fights are two-circle fights because we do want an opportunity to shoot them with the mic. We pass, we want to turn, try to get around and take a shot at them with the mic. And, and most head-on fights, if they're similar airplanes, right, starting at similar energies, Fulcrum versus, you know, F-16, what's going to happen? It's just going to end up being a, get lower and slower in this grovel. Okay, as we spend energy for position, lower and slower in the grovel. At some point in there, though, you can take the fight vertical. Okay, you can use that energy egg we talked about. You can take the fight up into the vertical, okay, and that's, that's another option. The time I use the vertical is when I go out there and look up at the sun and say, there it is, right in front of me. Because if I get that sun lined up and create a shadow in the cockpit, and that guy's down that, from that shadow, well, guess what? <laughs> he doesn't see me. You know, he doesn't see me. I'm in the sun. Anytime I line that bandit up with the shadows, if I see that high sun, that is one time I'll go up. Most times I don't go up. Because if you go up, you got that cold blue sky and the missile, you know, you're a hot target among that cold blue sky, so I don't like to go up. Normally, I'll keep the fight two circles. To review, a fighter pilot has several options during a head-on pass. The first and foremost option is to take a shot, if you can, at the bandit. If the bandit doesn't blow up, you should think carefully about your escape window. The ability to leave the fight is biggest right at the pass. If you decide to turn, you can turn away from the bandit or into the bandit. Depending on which way the bandit turns, this will cause a one-circle or two-circle fight. A two-circle fight will give you, and possibly the bandit, a better chance at a head-on missile attack. A one-circle fight will tend to jam both fighters inside minimum range for a heat missile shot. Remember, it will normally require a lot of energy to convert a head-on pass into a shot. The Century Series aircraft that replaced the F-86 all had one thing in common. They are fast as hell. Now, speed's fine, but it's not everything. When you put razor-thin wings on a fighter so it'll go Mach 2, you can't turn. When you discard the bubble canopy in favor of an aerodynamically slick design, you can't see. But you play the hand you're dealt. This is a 105 Thunder Chief, affectionately known as the Thud, the biggest single-engine fighter ever built. It was designed to deliver nuke weapons very low and very fast, but it ended up hauling iron bombs and rolling thunder. On paper, in a pure 1v1 against a MiG, it hardly stood a chance. Yet Thud Pilot shot down 27 of them, 25 with a gun. They didn't accomplish this remarkable feat because of the air-to-air -air virtues of the Thud. They did it through discipline and mutual support and guts. It's been said that the really great fighter pilots possess three traits, hands, head, and heart. So if you ever find yourself searching for that intangible definition of heart, think of the guys that flew silver thuds downtown to the city on the river. 
a destination from which many of them would never return. So now we're going to take some questions from a Falcon users group called the 510th Tactical Fighter Wing. Any of you guys have any questions on the stuff we just covered? Pete, i got a question for you. Sure. You were talking earlier about maintaining an optimum turning rate of about 440 knots. Yeah. What's the difference between maintaining a steady turn and going into a turn, jamming full back on the stick, pulling maximum Gs, and losing energy? Are you going to come out with the same end result? Yeah, it's, the, the issue is, do you maintain right at your airspeed, you know, and do whatever G it takes to make, to, or do you just pull and spend it all? On almost every case that I gave you here, when you're on defense, you spend it all. Because the, the, the concept is, wh why die with a 50 extra knots? You know, I mean, you know, it's just like, you know, you get to heaven, you say, hey, but I got 50 extra knots. Nobody cares up there, you know, or wherever else you go. You know, how many <coughs> knots you had on your jet when you get killed, when you died. So we really don't care. So really, when you're on defense, you just spend it. But on offense, that's a very good question. Because really, when you're driving here, remember I said you're going to put your nose in like pursuit? Well, a couple ship whiffs back. I mean, that's not very precise. So right in there is where I like to maintain my airspeed. I think that, that, that's an excellent point, because when, when the guy's behind you, you just turn. Okay, But when you're head on or when you're on offense, now you can play that turn. There is no need to just spend, spend it all. You will, over time, you will turn better if you keep your airspeed. But you've got to be in a tactical position to do that. And this is not it. This is create maximum BFM problems right now, because you remember, each time tick he closes, your ability to generate problems go, is less. Yeah. It's less because now he's getting inside your turn circle. So you want to just spend it here. But on the other situations, offense and head on, you want to try to maintain corner. Now, there are times when I feel I can get a shot, I spend it. I just yeah. spend it. And, and also on offense, you're not going to be able to stay at corner. I mean, because you're going to start to see your, this lag build. You're just going to keep pulling. You don't want to get too far back in lag, or else now you're going to get this big thing. So you want to try to stay at corner, but you're not going to be able to do it. You know at altitude. At sea level, you probably could in an F-16, but at 20,000 feet, you're going you're gonna to bleed off energy in a, in a turn, mm -hmm. you know. Okay, next question. Yeah, I've got one. So when you, when you get to that control position, if the bandit starts doing the scissors, do you, do you recommend trying to get slower yes. at that point? Yes, yes. Yes, you've got no choice but to get slower. When you start to see this low heading crossing angle, you control your overtake with throttle. And, and, and we have a gun's defense out now. It's, it's, it's the most current uh, rage to, to sweep the F-16 community called the snake. And where a guy just does a snaking gun's defense. He's, he's pulling and he's doing a subtle throttle changes with each move of the snake. He's snaking, you know, and then he turns and rolls and he kind of snakes back the other way. And each time he's slowing down, hoping that you're getting bored in on him, bored in on him, and whoa, now, now we're into this, uh, you, know, you know, scissor situation. So the answer is yes, you have got to slow down. You don't care. You're going to kill him. You want to kill him. Because once you kill him, what's, now you can speed up. You see? So you don't want to just say, well, I want to maintain my energy. I want to maintain my energy. I want to maintain. Well, good. I'm glad I did. Now I got a good defensive turn to do. You know, you don't want to do that. Use your throttle to stay behind a guy. Because once you're committed, I said, your escape window's closed. You got to kill him. So you just have to do with the you know, left hand, whatever you have to do to kill him. Pete, why is it that in offensive BFM, <laughs> the yo-yo maneuver is taken away from us? Well, yeah, we didn't talk about uh, yo-yos. And, and you, whenever you read any material or, or see things, e even people talk and they talk in terms of yo-yos. Yo-yos are a maneuver that we used to do. And what it's based on is the bandit turns, and, and you make a turn. But instead of making this turn in the horizontal like we did, you make a vertical turn. You climb, you get turning room above the bandit. Now you use God's G to turn more efficiently in the vertical okay, than this bandit's doing in the horizontal. But the premise is, that you gain this turning room and you own this turning room, that this bandit cannot come up into you and take the turning room away, okay? And when I learned how to do this in F4 against an F5, for example, I'd drive into my F4, the F5 would turn, and then I'd take the F4 uphill into this yo-yo. It's about 3,000 feet above the, above the bandit. And then I'd come downhill, turn that old rhino, you know, better in the vertical, you know, than this F5 was turning. But the F5, after about 90 degrees of turn, was stuck horizontally, could not come up. 
to take my turning room away. If I had been fighting somebody that could come up, like an F-16, I would have gone uphill, right, and this guy would have turned, and he would have come up into me to, to take away my turning room, which is a, a, you know, a learning objective for BFM, take away his turning room, and now you'd have almost like a head-on pass, because instead of being stuck here now where I can turn you know, and get behind him, this guy could now pull up into you, and guess what? Now, you, this guy's got his nose high, you've got your nose low, and he's got the first use of God's G to lead turn you down the backside. So you're actually at a disadvantage. Okay, we've talked about 1v1 maneuvering. We've talked about offensive maneuvering. We've talked about defensive maneuvering and head-on. Hopefully, I, I've given you the, the techniques that we're currently using out there you know, in the F-16 world so that you can take those and, and, and use them to be successful out there in combat. One of the things that's important to a fighter pilot is style. You know, you like to do things with style. There's no doubt you can fly around, get some shots, you know, kill some people in, uh, in the simulation, have fun. But really, we're trying to do it with style. What style implies to a fighter pilot is discipline, execution of the basics. What you're going to find out there when you fight, that this stuff has got to be instinctive. You're not going to do your best creative uh, thought when you're under pressure in the fight, whether it's with, when you're doing it with JP4 or whether you're doing it in the simulation. Remember, You've got to train like you fight, and fight to win. A lot of people who watched the Gulf War on TV concluded it was technology alone that carried the day. Oh yeah? What about this A-10, affectionately known as the Warthog? A plane so slow it's been referred to as like flying your own crop duster with a gun. But in the hands of capable pilots that use mutual support and discipline and the ability to strafe over 90% with a 30 millimeter Gatling gun, it literally ripped the guts out of Iraqi's armor. But that was air to mud. What about air to air? The F-15 Eagles blitzed the Iraqi Air Force 31 zip. Now the F-15 is a great air superiority fighter, but let me tell you, a MiG-29 is no slouch. The truth of the matter is, we could have done it with these planes, or F-18s, or we could have traded equipment for that matter. It wouldn't have made a difference. By all indications, the F-22 that's coming on the line is a marvel. But you can rest assured that someday, somewhere, someone's going to step up with a worthy opponent. Years ago, the great World War II ace Adolf Galan wrote, only the spirit of attack born in a brave heart will bring success to any fighter, no matter how highly developed it may be. That's still true today. For in the fighter game, Lockheed and GD and Mac Air build great airplanes, but men still win wars. Two one copies, uh, two four five ten, no join. Okay, we've got a pair. We're engaging on the nose. Copy eighteen, same direction. Okay, there's one to my right, one to my left. Four no tally. I'm taking the guy on the left. Tally. I got a contact forty two on his contact forty four left for six. Okay, looks like he's converting on us, 2-2. I got him off the left wing at 1-6 thousand. He's about six miles down, second left. I've got the eagle going up. Disregard, disregard. The target is friendly. Six is clear. I've got an eagle on belly up to 2-1, two, 2-3. Two, Confirm your engage. Coming up to on an eagle. Yeah, we're going to go engage. Yeah, we're engaged. Up to that. Uh, we're directly above you. Coming back to the west. 2-2. Two, two. Heads up, heads up. We're about to fight. 2-1. Directly above you now, 2-2. Two, two. Can you order? How many can you take that guy? Can you take him? 2-2. Two, two. Fox 2. Fox 2 on the Eagle, passing through north. Okay, heads up, heads up, 2-1. Uh, you got one coming in? Yep, taking it from the bottom. 2-1, no joy. Break right, 2-1 or 2-2. 2-1, two, two. Two breaking right. Okay. Got one at your six. Box two kill on the F, the high F-15 passing through west. Left hand turn. Two three, you got an F-15 on your tail. This is four percent drive. Box go one. Box two on the F-15 and a right hand turn. 15 pounds. Go for them. Two one. Eagle, 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 Okay, I got both of eagles above each other. I'm on the high one, visual the F-16. Tracking, tracking, kill F-15, right turn at the 
Master's F-16C cockpit environment, equipped with all the gear you need to feel the excitement. Fully functional 64-switch control panels, mil-spec strain gauge stick, and F-16C throttle. With Thrustmaster controls and your favorite sim, turn your den into a furball you'll never forget. The Mark II WCS, FCS, and rudder control system. No matter which Thrustmaster equipment you choose, you'll experience more realism, more control, more kills. After all, the ultimate test is to stay alive. <laughs> 